This is my 32nd video on my work with OO Gauge. See part 1 of this series for my reasons for getting into OO Gauge when I already had a lot invested in working in N Gauge and I didn't really have space for a large, fully operational OO Gauge layout. Also see my lengthy series on my N Gauge railway modeling for smaller and more complex scenery and smaller scale trains running. This part is the sixth, dealing with my third layout to be made using mainly Hornby set tracks. See the prior video, part 27, for my reasons for wanting to try a Hornby set track layout when I already had an OO gauge layout using Bachmann Easy Track. This part deals with further work on my Hornby layout, specifically laying track bed and track and also completing the wiring. This was where I got to at the end of my last video. Cork had been laid uh, under the junction and point areas of the track, and also where the engine shed and goods shed and associated buildings were intended to go. Cork had also been laid as a road running around the centre area of the layout, and all of the cork had been painted a dark grey. The yard area where the turntable is to go had been painted light grey. So my next step was to lay track bed for the remaining tracks, those not covered by the cork, essentially all of the unbranched tracks between the points, both main lines and sidings. I had purchased Rapido Noise Killer Foam Road Bed to use for this purpose. Why Rapido Noise Killer and not Woodland Scenics? Well, for one thing, the Noise Killer was about half the price of the Woodland Scenics Road Bed at my local hobby store, and also from what I was able to see, I actually preferred the look of it. It's thinner than the Woodland Scenics. Rapido mainline track bed is 3.5 millimeters thick, and they also make a branch line version which is only 2 millimeters thick, whereas Woodland Scenics road bed is 5 millimeters thick, quite a bit more. And the Woodland Scenics road bed seemed a lot more squishy, partially, I'm sure, due to the extra thickness. And I was worried that this squishiness could cause problems. I like the firmer feel of the Rapido road bed. I was a little surprised to find on opening a box of the Rapido track bed that it didn't come as a continuous 25 foot roll as I had assumed from what I could see through the window of the packaging. Rather it came in separate lengths, each about a metre long, wrapped together into a roll. Here's one of the lengths separated and laid out. As I say, around a metre in length, I actually found this arrangement quite convenient. I used Woodland Scenics foam tack glue to glue down the track bed. I had lots of other glue around the place, white glue, yellow glue, construction glue, etc. But I'd seen reviews that indicated that the Woodland Scenics foam tack glue really was particularly effective for gluing down foam track bed. And that it could make the process much easier. And I have to say that I absolutely found this to be true. The foam tack glue was most definitely a worthwhile investment. I had previously marked where the tracks were to go before removing all of the track from the board. Now I laid the foam roadbed down along those marks. I put a bead of the foam tack glue all along the centre of a stretch, then I spread it thin using a spatula seen at bottom left here, and then quickly positioned the roadbed and pressed it down. The foam tack glue worked excellently, allowing a little movement as the roadbed was first positioned, but holding it rapidly once it was pressed down for a few moments. I did use push pins to hold the roadbed in place. This was a bit of a problem as I built my board using MDF, and it was very difficult to get the push pins to go into the MDF, which is very tough stuff. At times I felt as if I was trying to push a noodle into a concrete wall. However, with a lot of pushing and a bit of twisting, I did manage to get the push pins to hold. It's rather tricky to persuade the foam roadbed to adopt a curve, since you're stretching one side and compressing the other, the roadbed really doesn't want to lie flat around the curve. If it hadn't been for the fast gripping of the foam tack glue, I don't think I would have been able to get this done. Here you can see the roadbed going round the two curves in the main loops at the far end of the layout. Because of the fast and secure grip of the foam tack glue, I was able to get the roadbed laying flat around all of the curves. However, it was a bit of a struggle, and unfortunately I may not have got the curvature exactly even all of the way round. 
It isn't too easy to be geometrically precise when you're fighting to get the roadbed bent round and tacked down without distorting. Here's the result after leaving the glue to set thoroughly and then taking out all of the pins. It's not too bad, though there are some slight errors in the exact positioning. Next, I put all of the track back down, laying it as best as I could around the roadbed. It didn't go down too badly. As you can see, I was basically able to get all of the track onto its intended roadbed, though I couldn't entirely avoid the track being off-center on the roadbed in some areas. The sidings didn't present too much of a problem, as there the track can be pushed from side to side a bit without issues. But the main loops were more tricky, as pushing one end of the loop inevitably also moved the rest of the loop. And this being set track, not flex track. You can see here that the tracks going round the bends of the loop are really too far towards the outside. The other ends of the loop also initially came out rather poorly centred. I hooked up power using temporary clips as I still hadn't done the main power wiring and ran a loco round all of the tracks to check for bad joins or other problems. I did consider taking out pieces of set track from the back straights and substituting custom pieces of flex track, thinking this might enable me to get the track better centred on the roadbed, but I eventually decided that probably wouldn't help much and I was able to get the track somewhat better centred just by adjusting the loops all of the way round. It still wasn't perfectly centred, but I felt I could live with how it was. So I next moved to fixing down the track. I had vacillated between gluing down the tracks and using pins. I eventually decided to go with pins. I used Pico SL14 track pins. I didn't really have much choice as there wasn't anything else available locally. At least not specifically as track pins, although I suppose I might have found something usable at a hardware store. Anyway, I went ahead with the SL14 pins. I did initially try to drill pilot holes for them but they're only 0.5mm in thickness, and I found that I really couldn't drill the MDF of my board with a 0.5mm drill. The drill was too bendy and weak, and the board was too hard. And if I drilled with anything larger than 5mm, the track pins just didn't hold at all. So I resorted to driving the pins in without pilot holes. This wasn't at all easy, since, as previously noted, MDF is tough stuff, and the Pico pins are quite fragile. The heads of the pins are also not a lot bigger than the holes in the Hornby track, so if you damage the hole at all, the pin won't hold. It also doesn't help that I have a bad back, and I had to do all of this working bending over the board, which became increasingly painful for me. In many cases, I failed to get the pins to go into the MDF. I probably bent and threw away at least as many pins as I successfully inserted. I was initially trying to drive the pins in with a combination of a tack hammer and a punch, but I eventually concluded that just pushing the pins in using a fat brass drift probably worked better, though I still destroyed a fair proportion of the pins. I'd only made one power connection to the track in a permanent manner previous to this point, the switched power feed to one of the outer sidings on the left. Before pinning down all of the track, I needed to make the remaining power feeds a switched feed to the head shunt at the front right of the board, and unswitched full-time feeds to the inner and outer loops. So I went back to the bench, powered up my soldering station, and clamped my helping hand to the bench. I should say that I found this soldering station a very worthwhile investment. For years I tried to do my soldering using cheap plug-in soldering irons, but it really is so much easier using a proper thermostatically controlled soldering station. I resisted for years because basically I'm cheap and high-end soldering stations can run up to a thousand bucks or more, but I picked this one up for just under a hundred bucks from my local hobby shop and so far it's worked fine and has made soldering so much easier. The helping hand, the thing with the clamps and the weighted base, also helps a lot although I do find that I have to clamp it to the bench, as otherwise it tends to annoyingly shift just as I'm trying to work, even though the base is weighted. I had used these Pico power feed joiners to make the power connections on my back Manoa gauge layout, and I still had some of them left. 
However, when it came to making the power feeds for this layout, I didn't really see the point of using these. I'd still have to solder every wire, as the Pico joiners only come with very short wires attached, and really it seemed simpler to just solder my own wires directly to the fish plates. Another consideration was that I really didn't want red wires for the connections on this layout, as some of the insulation was likely to be visible with the Hornby track, and black would be less noticeable. It really isn't at all difficult to solder wires to fish plates, at least with a helping hand and a soldering station. I just stripped a small amount at the end of each wire, only about an eighth of an inch, tinned the stripped ends of the wire, roughened the bottom centre of the fish plate with a small file, tinned that, and then applied the tinned wire to the tinned fish plate and just touched it with the hot tip of the soldering iron. The results weren't entirely neat, but they were perfectly serviceable. I did three sets of these, one with seven feet of wire for the head shunt and two with four feet of wire for the main loops. I used feed wire that came uh, with two wires joined together, which helped to make things easier to thread through holes and tidier to arrange. The soldered fish plates are just used to join two tracks and then the wire is threaded through a hole drilled in the board. Then I needed to check the direction of connection by testing with a loco, as of course it's important that all of the power connections go in the same direction. Especially so if they may connect with each other, as that could produce short circuits. But even if they don't actually connect with each other, it wouldn't really work for passing loco control from one zone to another if they weren't set up to go in the same direction. The connection to the head shunt is a switched feed, as I want to be able to supply power there when I want to move an engine there, but also to be able to leave engines parked there whilst running other locos elsewhere. So one side of the head shunt connection is passed through the little Atlas triple switch with the yellow slider seen beside the Tech 2 controller here. The two power feeds to the main loops will not be switched, as I don't envisage wanting to park trains on the main line. Here you can see that I've separated the tracks, removed the original fish plates, and drilled a hole in the centre of the track bed. Now I'm passing the power feed wire through that hole, and then I'll use the power feed fish plates to reconnect the tracks. And here are the two power feeds for the main loops in place. They're not invisible, but they're hardly obnoxiously noticeable, and should be less so once the track is ballasted. Now let's just see some video of testing of the track at this point. Okay, now I've got the track down. Um, it's, it's the underlay is down, the track is actually pinned down. The next step would be ballasting, basically so. But before I ballast it, I want to make sure that I don't need to do any more corrections to the track. Now I've already run after I put it down, but before I pinned it, I um, ran um, engines round everywhere to check for bad, uh, you know, bad connections, bad fish plates, or whatever, or any problems with air connectivity. Um, and I did find a few places where I'd put the p a couple of places where I put the fish plates on badly and fixed those. But I want to have one more try, because once I start putting ballasting down, it's going to be a lot harder to correct any problems. Uh, now, this is not a good engine, really. I'm not going to do a lot with this engine, because this engine needs servicing. Famous last words. They need servicing, that engine. It's a, it's a um, Hornby tender-driven Black 5 that I bought off eBay. And it just about goes, but it needs, um, but it needs uh, servicing. And it's running at 70% power. The little pug there is running at 30% power, and they're going about the same speed. Um, but that's just, I just thought I'd do that just to illustrate that we do have the two separate uh, loops going in opposite directions. and. Uh, you know, they're all hooked up to the power. The pug is not really hesitating at all, I don't think. The uh, black fly is hesitating when it goes over the points, but it needs servicing. Okay. So I'm going to bring the black fly to a halt there. I will bring the pug to a halt there as well. 
So I'm going to take the black flag off for now. Because he's not a good engine to be testing things with since he needs, severely needs servicing himself. Okay, so... Famous last words, if I can keep straight, we check where we have track. The right hand is the outside loop. Okay. So let's switch this point and move the pug off onto the siding. Oh, famous last words. Oh, no, he's on the outside loop. I don't know what I'm doing, do I? Okay. Hang on a bit. So let's... So he's on the outside loop. Let's bring him onto the inside loop for a minute. We'll set the points for the crossover between the inside and outside loop. We'll leave that point for now. Ah. Okay, we'll set the power on the inside loop about the same as the power on the inside, the outside loop, and hopefully we can bring him across the crossover. Oh, of course we can't. Ah, he's got stuck on the point. Aha! He's got stuck on point. The reason he's got stuck on point is not because his connection is poor. The reason he's got stuck on point is because I forgot to change the direction on the inside loop. I had them going in opposite directions. So now let's set the two loops in the same direction and now maybe he'll go across the crossover. Yes, he will, see? There we go. Oh, it's just my mistake. I, I had the black five going in the opposite direction to him and forgot to change the direction. Oops. Now we need to change that point so he doesn't hit the point in the wrong direction. Uh, but there you go. He's noticed that he's going around the inside loop perfectly smoothly, not hesitating like the black five was. Now we will set the point now to move him up into the sidings. And the other point's also set so he's going to go into the right-hand siding where the good shit's going to be. Okay. So now let's bring him out of there. And change that point and put him into the other side. He doesn't seem to like the points very much, but I don't know what I can do about that. And we'll take him back out onto the main loop. I mean, he's, he's certainly got power everywhere, right? He's not having any problems with not having power there. Um, Okay, so now we will set the crossover back. Ah. If I can figure out my directions. Set the power on the outside loop and try and move him back across the crossover to the outside loop. There we go, so now he's on the outside loop. Crossover back. I mean, I just use this pug for testing because he's a very, he's, a, he's not, he's not got a very long wheelbase or anything, but he is a very reliable engine. Now we'll set the crossover to move him round onto the outer sidings. If I can remember which one, what I'm doing. And there he is. He's on the outer sidings. Now, let's, let's move into the outer one of those for now. Oh. And I genuinely do not have power there. That's a bit... He hesitated there. That's not good. Is there a problem with the power connection there? It seems to work now. Um, the other siding has its own separate power, so I have to turn the power on to it if I want him to go into it. It's got a separate... It's got a separate power feed. Whoops, nearly ran into the bumpers there. It's got a separate power feed here, so now if I turn that power feed off. Oh, God, if I could remember what we're doing anyway. Um, it won't, he won't do anything. But if I turn it on, he will. If I, if I operate the right control. See, that's a, now he's moving. But I turn that off. He doesn't move because the power here is only coming from there through that switch. Okay, so now he's out of there again. Now, the other trick is we set that. Now, at the moment, having some... Oh, God, I can't remember which controller is which. Which controller is he? That one, the right hand one. Okay, so now I've set that. Now, oh, famous last words. I'm surprised. 
Oh, I've got that. No, should be. Set these. Yes, now he's not going at all. Because there's no power coming to it, but I can turn. There's another power feed here, which I can turn on with this switch, and now he should go. There you go. And now he can move all the way down to the end of the head shunt. But that's only because this power is on. If I turn that power off, he no longer moves. But when I've got that power on, that supplies power here, and he can move, he can go all the way to the end of that other siding based on that power feed there. But if I turn that power feed off, he immediately stops. Okay, well that's what's supposed to happen. Well, the only thing I was a little, he did seem to hesitate here. I don't know whether. Um, I don't know whether there's a... Is there a bad connection there? He seems to go over that area smoothly enough now. Oh, well, it's probably okay. I mean, if the worst comes to the worst, and I do get, after I've put the ballasting down, I get, say, like a bad connection between two tracks, I can always bring the soldering station up and, and solder, the, uh, solder the connection. I haven't soldered any of the connections at the moment. They're all just relying on the fish plates. And if they work with the fish plates, I'm going to leave them like that. I'm not particularly keen on soldering track for the sake of it. But, you know, if I have a connection that's bad after I've ballasted, it, then I'm not going to pull it up and try and redo the fish plate. I'll just solder it. Anyway, so I think I'm ready for ballasting now. It seems like all the track is down and works. It's not perfectly, unfortunately, in the middle of the track bed. Um, that was just, you know, inaccuracies gluing the track bed down, basically. And it's set track, it's not flex track. So, you know, if, if I, glue the, I glued the um, track bed down slightly off the right radius, there's a limit to what I can do to try and fit the track onto it. It's all on the track bed. It's just not right in the middle of the track bed, unfortunately, but that was the best I could do.